If we follow the news closely, now today, Iran is the only country in the world that isn't a declared nuclear power currently producing, get this, 60% enriched uranium, which can be converted to weapon-grade material within days. U.S. officials have said it, it would take Iran less than two weeks to convert enough 60% material into a form that could be used in a nuclear weapons. But meanwhile, Iran also continues to aid Russia in its war with Ukraine, and part of the growing axis between Iran and Washington's top international foes. If you know the news, or if you know the facts, that when it comes to the nation of Iran, and we should not be unfamiliar with the word sanctions, for decades, the U.S. government and also other international major actors like place sanctions upon the nation over and over again. But until today, we still need to ask the question, does sanction actually work? And if so, in what ways? And also, how does the government of Iran react regarding the sanctions from the West? And does that mean for this upcoming relationship between U.S. and Iran at this moment, it's not going to be a brighter future. Well, in this episode, we are going to address all the critical questions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is the Dr. Vali Nassar. Dr. Nassar is the Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And also, he is a non-resident senior fellow at Atlantic Council's South Asia Center. And his latest book is entitled, How Sanctions Work. Well, Dr. Nassar, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Thank you. Well, Dr. Thank Nassar, again, nice for inviting me. again, it's our pleasure to have you on the show. I want to get started. I have to say that your book is entitled... The How Sanctions Work, it's one of the fascinating books, and should we say, even the topics that we're still discussing within the international community. I want to read something to you. I want to get your further explanation. Now, this is what you had in the book. You wrote, and I quote, that the 40 plus years of U.S. and international sanctions and recently the maximal use of sanctions have been leveled on Iran not only to punish its behavior, but also to force the Islamic Republic to change course, desist from supporting terrorist activities, refrain from aggressive regional policies, and abandon its nuclear ambitions. Now, I think the question we need to ask and we need to understand is, what is the real purpose of placing sanctions upon the country such as Iran? And also, despite the sanctions that we've seen, how come that we're still seeing this ongoing development and also the resistance from the Iranian government in terms of the nuclear weapon development? Your thoughts? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, that goes to the heart of this book, which my colleagues and I put together based on a, a long period of research. I mean, sanctions, it's important to say, has become uh, the, the foreign policy tool of choice for the United States. It's, uh, it's used as a weapon, if you would, in foreign policy, uh, and it has honed its applicability significantly over time. Until the Ukraine war, Iran was the most uh, sanctioned country in the world, and it has been in, under increasing level of sanctions over 40 years, not just because of its nuclear program, but even before that. And so it's the best case study of this new American foreign policy tool. And the case of Iran is very instructive when we talk about Russia and China as well. In other words, as the United States uses sanctions both to punish governments and also to change their behavior, it's a good question. Uh, what is its impact and does it work? So simply the impact is multifaceted because you don't put sanctions, you put sanctions on governments, but you really apply it against people often. So you, you don't allow a country to trade. You expel it from international financial sections. You cause unemployment. You cause poverty. You, you cause changes in the balance of power between different social classes in countries. The middle class gets smaller. The poorer class gets bigger. 
you you securitize a country's economy because the economy goes more and more underground mm. the trade goes more and more underground uh, and and therefore it gets into the hands of the security sector and then the question you ask will does it work if you look at the case of iran it does not work mm. in other words as you and i are speaking there is a war going on in the the least in which iran is very deeply involved in the form of its support for hezbollah in the form of its support for houthis in yemen it's attacking us bases uh, we just read uh, reports that you know I- iranian spy ships are helping houthis in yemen shut down trade over the red sea uh, and and therefore uh, so and this is a country that's still under s- severe sanctions and its nuclear program has actually expanded and i have to say that you know iran and the united states and or other countries around the world arrived at a nuclear deal president trump came out of that deal put iran on under maximum sanctions and under those maximum sanctions iran did not abandon its nuclear program mm. it actually expanded it. and uh, today is a much more dangerous uh, uh, nuclear power and also those in power in iran became more and more hardline and radical so the leadership of the country became more and more radical the security forces under the leadership of the revolutionary guards have taken over larger and larger parts of iran's economy under massive sanctions and are suffocating uh, uh the society and the economy uh, today under maximum pressure sanctions since president trump put them in place Iran's middle class has shrunk by, by some estimates between 10 to 20% of the middle class has fallen below uh poverty line and you need a middle class you need a private sector if you're going to have opening of societies mm. if we look at southeast asian experience if we look at you know generally asian experience uh, wherever you have commerce global integration you have opening of economies you have democracies it's happened because you have a large middle class that's integrated in, into the world economy and is connected to an independent private sector sanctions kills all of those things but yes in the west we claim that we want better government in iran but in reality sanctions produces worse government and i would add to this as we looked at this well we saw that there's another reason for imposing sanctions because it's very easy and cheap in the united states to do that Mm. it allows the united states to pretend like it's doing something without actually having to send soldiers and and actually spend money especially if you're dealing with a smaller country like like uh, like iran in other words every time iran does something or you want to please a political constituency you say well, okay we're going to add more, more sanctions to iran the sanctions don't cost anything to the american people because they don't import anything from iran mm. it doesn't uh, it doesn't impact americans because you don't actually have to take their sons and daughters and send them as soldiers to to fight a war mm. and yet you can claim that that you're doing something so it's become in a way a lazy man's tool of appearing to be doing something without doing something but the actual impact if you say we're in, we're, we're we're imposing sanctions in order to get iran to behave better to to abandon its nuclear uh, uh weapons to su- stop supporting Hezbollah or Houthis in Yemen that's that's had the opposite impact where sanctions are really really effective is actually in devastating ordinary people mm. and especially the kind of people you think would be pro western pro trade pro openness right in other words those are the people who get impacted by sanctions and so yes sanctions are impactful in terms of changing iran's society changing russia's society down the road changing china's society but it's there is no record that it actually changes the behavior of the governments in fact it worsens them mm. professor nasser i want to move on to um another topic again going back to the book just follow your thoughts or follow your explanation logically because again you said crystal clear that sanctions today don't really work as the way we want so however in the book 
you also include a Iranian university professor. Again, we're grateful that he was able to join the book and interview for the book. This is what he said, and I quote, I want to get your better explanation. And I quote, if the nuclear sanctions get removed, then the West will sanction us for our ballistic missiles, and then you will be human rights sanctions, and then you will be another reason for sanctions. Just look at any country that has challenged Western power, whether politically or economic. What do you see? They get sanctions in order to break their will and make them succumb to the Western power. End quote. Now, let's talk about the content that from the Iranian university professor. Correct me if I'm wrong, doctor,、uh, professor. You are the expert. It sounded to me that in order to manipulate Iran. U.S. is willing to place sanctions upon the country, even though we know that sanctions don't work. So I guess the professor、uh-huh. is suggesting that U.S. could find any other reason to manipulate the countries that challenged or directly challenged this U.S. supreme power. What is the explanation, or how should we understand the statement behind that? Go ahead. Well, first of all, that statement is important because it, 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 whether correct or not, it tells you the way in which、uh, the recipient country, or at least the university professor in that recipient country, sees sanction.、Mm. So you could see even the leadership in Iran sees it that way. That that、uh, you know the 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 actual、um, excuse that is given for sanctions is just an excuse that even if we complied. That then they're going to move to sanction us on something else because in in America's view they say the world is divided to those who are our friends and those who are our enemies,、mm. right? And once sanctions are put in place, they never get lifted. And for Iranians, the proof is that they signed the nuclear deal, and they abided by it. And then President Trump came in, tore up the nuclear deal, and increased sanctions, right? So they they believe that what the United States wants is for Iran to become a completely different kind of a country, and the regime obviously in in power in Iran is not willing to do that. So it sees sanctions essentially as permanent, and it believes, rightly or wrongly, it, it believes that that、um, uh, uh, the, the the actual stated purpose of the sanctions is just an excuse. And you can say that you know perhaps the way this university professor talks. And thinks is the way that a university professor in Russia will think, and a university professor in China will think.、Mm. That once you fall on the wrong side of the United States and sanctions come, sanctions are not going to get lifted.、Mm. If you even said, "Okay, we agree with what you said, and we will not do it anymore," they'll come back with another excuse to go after you. Now, partly this has to do with the fact that sanctions are built on a bureaucracy in the United States. So、there's a whole division in the Treasury in the United States, which every morning they wake up to create new sanctions, to make sanctions more effective, to see how they can apply it more. They're almost like engineers sitting in the Pentagon looking at new missiles.、Mm. They, then you have a whole public opinion, opinion in Congress,、uh, and unlike war with sanctions, Congress can impose them. Con- Congress can prevent them from being lifted. Congress has a big voice in it, and so it, you know sanctions don't come up unless you see. Once you get under sanctions, sanctions don't come up. That's what this professor is saying. So it will only come up if you stop being the kind of government you are.、Mm. So in that sense, it's different from war, because in a war you start the war, then bo- both sides can decide they're going to stop shooting, and they arrive at an arms、uh, armistice at a, at a ceasefire. What he's saying is that there is no ceasefire in sanctions. There is only total s- surrender, and if and so countries have no real incentive to abide, right? In other words, sanctions gets you into a cycle that if the calculation of the other country and Iran is a very good case example of this, but you could say that Russia will think the same way, China will think the same way, Myanmar will think the same way, Venezuela will think the same way. Is that you can do one or two things that are wrong and get under sanctions, 
But if you do those one or two things right, the sanctions don't go away. Mm. So there is no incentive to behave better. Mm. In fact, you, you begin to behave worse in order to get leverage to just take those two sanctions, right? So, so in a way, that's why sanctions becomes counterproductive. So you see in Iran that that when sanctions got tougher, the, it's it's this it's the hardline, uncompromising, radical side of the Iranian regime that basically takes over. Mm. Right? They become more aggressive. They decided that if we were enriching to twenty percent, and the United States increased sanctions. Or maybe we should go to 60%. Mm. If we were two years away from nuclear weapons and if we agreed we're going to stop there and they didn't lift sanctions, and in fact they increased it, maybe we should get to two weeks before nuclear weapon and then we'll get direct attention or get to one week before nuclear weapon. You clearly see this psychology in North Korea. I mean, you may call them whatever you want. They're deranged, they're whatever they are. But they've made a calculation that sanctions on North Korea will not come up if they dismantled one or two nuclear power stations or didn't test long-range ballistic missiles. The West, the United States, not going to lift sanctions on them. So they, the only way they see to come out of pressure is to actually build bigger missiles. Mm longer range missiles to become even more threatening mm. right so so you actually encourage your adversary to be more aggressive uh, because the calculation is whatever got them in trouble is not not doing it is not going to get them off the trouble it's being more menacing it's being more troublesome that might get them off trouble mm. and that's where the danger is with sanctions it actually makes the world more dangerous mm. Dr. Nassar, I want to go back to the introduction that we discussed initially. Again, as we mentioned before, Iran is the only country in the world that currently producing 60% enriched uranium. And also experts believe that Iran already has a sufficient stock of highly enriched uranium to fill the three weapons. Now, put all the statement together. What does that signify to the West and also to the international community? I mean, in other words, you say U.S. place sanctions upon Iran, place sanctions around Russia and China. But in reality, we understand crystal clear that China, Russia, and, your, uh, and also um, Iran are good friends. In reality, that's the truth. So how much do you think that those three partners are going to be unified or maybe should have already been unified to be against the West or to directly challenge the supreme power of the West. So what does that mean when we see the sanction on the three countries and also this political alliance or this political friendship behind the numbers? What does that mean, by the way? I mean, first of all, to your first part of your question, yes, Iran is producing 60% enriched uranium, and perhaps it might be producing more than that. And, and it's not the only country, but it's the only country that's doing it under the non-proliferation treaty. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and also is not one of the major accepted uh, nuclear powers in the world. Um, it, it tells you exactly that, that Iranians have calculated that reducing their nuclear program will not get, get them off sanctions. It's increasing their nuclear program that will actually maybe get some bargaining position with the West. But there is a, what you said is also true, that, that uh, Russia, China, and Iran, at least in this Eurasian construct, now see themselves facing the same kind of American foreign policy mm -hmm. and the same kind of attitude by the United States to different degrees. Iran has been an enemy country for 40 years. Russia is a recent enemy country. And China is increasingly being viewed as the, in a sort of a Cold War mentality in the United States, not just by the president or his administration, Republican, Democrat, but also by Congress in public opinion. Over the past year, 10 years, profile of China has changed significantly. All of these countries understand that as the level of sanctions increases, obviously on Iran very aggressively, on Russia aggressively, on China very slowly, 
that they are ultimately in the same boat. And they decide that they don't want to be alone. There is not some common interest, not just only common political interest with between China and Russia or China and Iran or Iran and Russia, but also a common economic interest. Mm. Right. So Iran now over 40 years has perfected certain technologies of of sanctions resistance. Right. In other words, it has it. Its economy has survived. It's it's sick, it's malfunctioning, it's inefficient, but it's still there. It's even capable of producing advanced uh, drones and missiles, right? Under sanctions, it has found ways to sustain itself. So the Russians will look to Iran and say, you know, can you help us develop the same kind of uh, technologies of resistance? The Chinese at some point will. Right. And, 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 also, and, and as a result, you, you, the, the U.S. policy and particularly reliance on sanctions is creating natural, I would say, common areas of interest between these countries, which may not otherwise have this degree of interest. Right. I mean, as we're speaking, there is now great investment being made by all three of them to create trade routes that could go through could go around the Malacca Straits for China. Mm. So the Russians are investing in the South trade route that goes through Iran uh, to the to the Persian Gulf, Arabian Sea, and Indian Ocean in order to avoid going through the Mediterranean and the Straits of Gibraltar and the Suez Canal, which could be blocked by the West, right? Uh, and... Um, and if you're investing in these trade routes, you obviously understand that that's a long-term investment. And that's because you don't believe sanctions are going to come off. And similarly, the Chinese are looking over the horizon. If the Americans are building this massive naval presence with AUKUS and the Quad and, and ultimately, you know, the Straits of Malacca are pretty narrow. And, and China perhaps does not want it to be 100% dependent on something that the West can close off, right? As these tensions with Taiwan grow, et cetera. So they're already saying, okay, how else can we connect to the world? And it's, uh, and uh, yes, it could be through Pakistan to Port of Gwadar, but ultimately it's through Iran and Russia, right? So, so again, the Chinese, which, you know, always have a long-term perspective, may look at this as a 20 year project. But why would you make a 20-year investment unless you thought that you're going to be dealing with sanctions for 20 years and that the current tensions with the U.S. are not going to go away? Mm. And in fact, they're going to get more, right? So when the Chinese look at Iran, uh, they don't dismiss it and say, oh, that's not us. They do. I think they do the opposite, that they, they say Iran could be us in 30 years. So we should start planning for that. Mm. Now, that that creates a natural relationship between China and Russia, which could be rivals in a different world mm. because of their border. Or China and Iran, which don't have necessarily points of commonality too much. Mm. Or Iran and Russia, which in the 19th century were great rivals, mm. right? So, so, the, the, so the American pressure of demanding that you're either with us or you're against us. Mm. And if we don't like you, we're going to put you on a lot of economic sanctions and we're going to crush your economy and we're going to cut you out of the world economy, right? Uh, you know, gives these countries an incentive to create an access of their own. And they look for support and strategic depth in one another, mm. right? The Russians need Iran. Iran needs Russia. Iran needs China. I and mean, why is China continuing to buy Iranian oil, Right? Ever since the West cut off Iran from uh, uh, trade with Europe, Iranian industry manufacturing has become increasingly reliant on Chinese capital goods, Chinese intermediate goods, mm. and Chinese raw materials, right? If you need a machine tools, you know, equipment, you're not going to get it from Germany anymore because of sanction. So you go to China and get it. So the consequence has been that part of Iranian economy that was very much dependent on the West has now become dependent on China. Mm. 
right? And the same is happening with Russians. Yes, there are some technologies China cannot provide you, like oil technology, advanced you know, energy technology, oil technology, but there's a lot China can provide you. Right? It can, it, 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 and, and as a result, these economies are becoming more dependent on Chinese sources of supply. Mm. And, and so, so sanctions is actually creating a much bigger problem for the West. Mm. Professor Nessar, I want to ask you the last question again, going back to your book. You defined a specific chapter, or should we say, labeled a, dis- a specific chapter called Defining a Society as the Enemy. Now, again, we know that when we called a society, well, when we called a community, a label as such enemy, which is not just refer- uh, referring to the enemy to the domestic voters, to the domestic citizens, it's more in this bigger and a larger picture. So how do you think that today, again, that kind of tie into uh, the term of social media as well. How do you think that today, the younger generations in Iran today, to understand and interpret it that the Iranian society, it's being governed and ruled by dictators. And to the outside world, this country is being seen as the enemy to the international community. So how do you think the younger generations, how do you think the citizens in Iran today, it's actually trying to break out the norms or trying to seek a better way or even to, uh, looking forward to this transformation and so that we can see more political economic stability for this upcoming future. Your final thoughts. So yes, the, the younger generation in Iran, as we saw in the protests against the Iranian government in 2022, uh, are, are definitely are, are tired of uh, dictatorship. They want to be integrated into the world. They want they want jobs, which are they they want better lives. They want social freedoms. But the problem is that sanctions has has taken away the ability of the society to push for these changes. Mm. So when the young people came into the streets, their parents didn't come. Why didn't their parents come? Because they can't afford to come. Mm. People in Iran are barely surviving. Uh, They they are poor. They depend on government handouts. And now today, because of increasing poverty, somewhere between 70 and 80% of Iranians depend on government handouts. They can't make ends meet if they don't get money for the government. Uh, if people are working two, three jobs and barely making it, they don't want demonstrations in the streets. They don't want disruption because it's economically impossible for them. When we look around the world, it's when you have wealthy middle classes that, that push for big change in society, right? You have independent private sector that doesn't depend on the government that can sustain a population. The poorer Iran becomes, the, the poorer its civil society becomes, the smaller the middle class, the more that even that middle class is dependent on the government, the, the less likely it is that it can support political change. Mm. I mean, political change is a great idea. People may be frustrated, but how do they translate that frustration into real change requires some degree of economic vibrancy, right? Uh, And and when you crush an economy, yes, people are angry, but people are being crushed under the pressure of economy. There is a lot of mismanagement and corruption in Iran's economy, no doubt. But our research and the details that are in in the book shows that that sanctions are greatly responsible for impoverishment of Iranian society. I mean, it's, it's like logical. And actually, that's the intent of sanctions. When you cut away a country from trade, when you say you cannot export, uh, that you cannot import, uh, you cannot even import medicine. Yes, you can import medicine, but you can't pay for it. Mm. When you cut a country out of a financial system, well, of course, the go- government revenue goes down. If people used to produce things in a factory and sh- and be able to export it, they can't. If they, you know, used to even sell pistachios or rugs, you know, the, the tons of Iranians would depend on carpet trade. The trade in carpets has come to zero because you can't buy from Iran. So those people go unemployed, mm. right? They get poorer. Poor people can't rebel. Poor people are angry, but pe- poor people can't afford uh, disruption in their lives. 
right? And, and as a result, there's no question that there's also a moral issue that we keep saying we're, we're sanctioning the country, but you really are sanctioning average people. Mm. You're basically putting your foot on the neck of the people saying, I'm going to pressure you until you rise up against your government. The very government that we say is dictatorial and it's bad, but we expect you to change your government. Mm. And in order to force you to change your government, we're going to put your foot on your neck. And the people are saying, I can't breathe. How can I change the government? How That's can I right. do anything? Right? So, so the entire pressure is put on average people. And, and, that, and that has shown over 40 years in Iran that it actually doesn't work. That's right, Professor. I agree with you 100%. Again, even though we're looking at how this country today is being governed and ruled by dictators, but it's not fair for the younger generations and also it's not fair for all citizens to suffer because of one person or one regime's selfish ambition for political reason and also for the economic reasons. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Dr. Valin Nassar. Again, Dr. Vassar is the Professor of International Affairs and Middle East Studies at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And I strongly encourage everyone to check out his latest book, which is entitled How Sanctions Work. Well, Professor, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. And we surely enjoy the conversation. Love to have you back on the show for our future episodes as we continue to monitor and pay attention to the nation of Iran. So thank you so much for doing this.